Why don't we uh, talk first of all about how uh, you got involved in the Urantia book when you first, I guess, heard about it and when you wanted to dedicate some of your time to work with the book and obviously promote the message in it. It actually began uh, quite a long time ago when I was a student in college at the University of Chicago when I was studying um, intellectual history, European uh, history of ideas, and engaged in, in uh, a lot of questions that I, I, I did not find answers to from professors and from books that I was reading. And it was around that time that just by total coincidence, I ran into somebody who uh, mentioned the Urantia book. And that was really quite early. It was really very much unknown in those days, except in very limited circles in the United States and in France and a few other places. And for whatever reason, it just immediately appealed to me. I, intuitively, I knew there was something special about it, and I didn't accept the, the claim of off-planet pedigree right away. But something, uh, it really rang truth bells uh, in me, and particularly the parts about history, since I was a student of history, and I, right away I began, I became a student of those parts of the Ranch book, and then it, it just progressed from there, and it's been really one of my main hobbies uh, throughout my, my adult life. Let's cover some of the basics in the beginning, some of the, some of the you know, questions that are obvious here. Well, first of all, what does Urantia mean? Yeah, Urantia is the purported name of our planet, according to the rest of the universe, so the off-planet celestial hierarchy and also uh, extraterrestrial visitors use that name or an equivalent of that name designation for us. So Urantia book refers to the name of the planet Urantia. And so let's get into who is behind it. Uh, we can just, you know, break this up in two different segments. Of course, the, the words themselves are written by somebody, but it's also a, a, another author or several maybe authors. Uh, break this down for us, Bar. Yeah, there's numerous supposed uh, celestial beings who are the authors of these papers, and there's 196, uh, they're called papers, they're like large chapters. And um, the the way this, uh, the story of how this comes about is, uh, goes back to all the way to 1906, when a very small group of people had a kind of channeled uh, celestial contact through a person who we still do not know the name of this person, the person is... Uh, anonymous as many guesses as to who it was but uh, there was uh, it was sort of an Edgar Casey style contact where the person was completely asleep and deep sleep and voices would come through this person and uh, after a period of time these voices announced that they were to present to these people around this person a a very large revelatory text and, and a, a number of years passed as they kind of uh, debriefed these people they were based in Chicago. These angelic beings began to sort of orient these people to what they wanted to do. And what they had intended to do was to present a very, an epical revelation to the planet. And we now know that there were other locations and other groups that were being cultivated for this purpose. And finally, they chose to, uh, this group seemed to have the right composition, the right location, the right mentality. So the revelation process formally begins in 1924. And uh, at this point, it's a, a, a rather different process of not the Edgar Casey style channeling, but the actual appearance or materialization of these, these papers, these chapters. Who, who do you, who kind of picked the group? Do you think is it was this a uh, a criteria from from this group that was well maybe not channeled them but in the Edgar Casey kind of style received? Did they have an outline of who they wanted to well give this to? I guess. Uh, you mean that, that, that they uh, survey sort of the human groups uh, from above and then select them? Uh, right, right, something like that. I guess. <laughs> yeah, they really what it is is uh, you know when these uh, events transpire uh, in the interactions between the celestial realms and humans, uh, apparently they, they do massive surveys and they look for the right, the right people that have the stamina and the intelligence to carry it off. The group actually assembled around a particularly world-class intellectual and, and leader, a guy named Bill Sadler, who was a professor at the University of Chicago. He was a, a, a surgeon and, and a psychiatrist. And he was the, kind of became the, the leader of this group over the next uh, 40 years, 50 years. The, the first copy, I think, of the, of the papers in a book format was uh, first published in, in 1955, correct? 
1955 it was first published, but the book was actually completed uh, some years before that. But they had a lot of proofreading to do, typesetting. But also the Celestials asked them uh, to wait a bit after World War II before they published it for a variety of reasons. So there was a bit of a delay in there. So it, 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 the book is was really current by... Uh, the late 40s, current in terms of known hum, you know, human knowledge uh, in the late 40s. And then there was this uh, period of delay until 1955. Yeah. All right. I, I mean, I know this is a lot about listening to the, the message, of course, and not about the messenger or getting kind of obsessed about that. But I mean, obviously, we have to ask, who are the celestial beings? Who is this? Where is this message coming from? Uh, kind of a huge question to answer because the Rancher book uh, presents an, un an unknown, unusual, what you would call, might call angelology. So the, this celestial hierarchy that they refer to, most of it is uh, terms that are that are unique to the Ranch book. But many terms that we know from the Bible and from other religions are sort of brought into this and then redefined for us. But many of the terms that are used in current usage in regard to angels are not used in the Arantia book. Some of the terms that are used are uh, words such as seraphim and cherubim, archangels, and other terms that you may not have heard of are, although there is a reference to this in the, in the Old Testament, there's a, a being called, beings called the ancients of days. And ancients of days are the oldest angelic beings in the universe of universes. And, and they reside at the center of a galaxy cluster as the chief angelic administrators of a very, very large group of, uh, of galaxies in these clusters. So those are the beings that uh, originally uh, instigated this revelation. So it's from a very, very high place from the highest uh, angelic beings uh, as described in the Arantia book. But it, it mainly comes through what we call the local universe administration. Uh, so in the cosmology, I guess the first thing folks would need to get to understand this is that the Rancho book offers a very vastly expanded cosmology from what we now have. For example, the timeline of the time-space universe is much extended to nearly a trillion years old, rather than the current, what is a 13.7 billion years. It's uh, kind of... Uh, Surprising how far the ranch book extends. And so what it says is that there is a central source universe, which is not a created universe. It is always existed. It's eternal. It's kind of like an island. You can picture it as an island hovering in the, in the middle of the universe, but it's outside of space-time. But it's, in a sense, the geographic center of all things. And it's the ge geographic center of infinity. Although that's a sort of a paradoxical notion, uh, it's a metaphor for what this is. And this eternal uh, mother universe is the source of all time-space universes. So there isn't a Big Bang cosmology here, but there's kind of a quasi-Big Bang in the sense that these time-space universes, which are galaxies, galactic, are, are created, there's, they're intentionally created by beings that descend from this mother universe to come into space-time, and then they initiate the actual phys physical uh, transactions that, that create galaxies, and uh, actually nebula that then, uh, that then cool to become galaxies. And so these are celestial beings, and this does not ha happen sort of by nature. It happens by intention, by high beings who, who create the conditions for the evolution of nebulas and galaxies, and then the, these galaxies begin to cool, and the suns and these galaxies, as they begin to cool, uh, begin to throw off planets, and the planets uh, cool, and, and eventually these become peopled over you know, billions and billions of years. And all, all throughout these different ages of the creation of the time-space universe, there, there are beings, uh, high celestial beings, who are managing this, from the central universe. Now, so if we get a little bit closer to this question of, of why it was written and, and what the book strives to, to achieve, it, it, it is about trying to give us um, the truth about our history, our origin, where we, comes from, where we come from, where, how things basically work in, in, in the universe. Is, is that correct? One of the key messages is 
that our planet Urantia is one of the one of the rarest planets in the local universe or any universe because our planet was was a planet where there was a massive rebellion of the angelic host on the planet. And so they're coming to help us understand that and the results of that in our history and to help correct the results of that angelic rebellion as well and to explain the extraordinary things that were done to try to retrieve the planet from what you might call the dark side. So uh, the reason your answer book is difficult, complicated, often overwhelming, is that we have a difficult, complicated, and overwhelming history. And so one has to be patient and try to understand this uh, from the standpoint of, from the standpoint of the celestial beings who are responsible for us. And they're doing quite a job here in providing this huge text, which does, you know, admittedly take, uh, you know, some years to understand. I know the book extends way beyond uh, the Bible and other religious texts as well, uh, but it seems to be also centered a, a lot around previous messages, previous revelations, if we can call it that. Is it trying to change those or correct those, uh, you know, scriptures like the Bible? Yeah, it is It is uh, helping to correct sort of the folklorish, folkloric aspect of uh, these previous records. And uh, truly, you know, they, they, they are of real events that come down in as legends in, you know, all the world's religions, simply because, you know, you don't have an authoritative celestial being who's writing it for you, but you have or humans, uh, charismatic humans who are recipients of a revelation and then write this down and it gets lost or it gets adulterated. So yes, a, a big part of this and the part that I've always found very interesting is making, first of all, indicating that there were previous revelation, previous sort of revelations to the planet that are entirely lost and then correcting other revelations such as the revelatory events that led to the, to the creation of the Hebrews, that led to Christianity, also even uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and other religions. They give uh, very essential information about other religions and how they were initiated and what happened to them. So yeah, what they, in fact, they have a phrase now that they use for this. It's uh, called the correcting time. And we are now in the, the period from 1955 is the correcting time that was not announced in the Arantia book, it was announced later, actually in the 1980s, in new transmissions that we haven't spoken about yet, but there's, uh, believe it or not, there's even more information that's come in the last uh, 25 years. And one of the new things they said is, yes, this whole thing is called the correcting time. We're correcting your civilization and getting you on back on course after having been way off course for, for millennia. Uh, there's a controversy, and it's a tough one because... You know, if you were, uh, I don't know, if you were a Mormon, say, and and after 100 years, uh, somebody said, well, now we have an update to the Book of Mormon. I mean, that would be an, uh, that would be pretty tough to, to handle. Yeah. And, and, and that happened also with A Course in Miracles. You may know, Henrik, that there were new, new presentations that came later and caused a split in that community. And, you know, I think it's just going to happen because uh, the planet is in a dire crisis. And, uh, you know, these loving beings, and believe me, you know, their whole mission is love and, and redemption uh, of the planet. They, they have to be around. We need them. So they've come back and they're updating their teachings. That's, that's what this new uh, mission is. It's an, it's, a, it's an update for, I think of it as an update for the postmodern mind, mm -hmm. whereas the, the Arantia book more, really appeals more to the modernist mindset. Uh, people, uh, you know, they when some new truth comes through, they become attached to it like a dog to a bone in a way, you know, because we're we're so desperate really to understand our, our situation, and uh, so you know, one has to have compassion uh, for the sort of the fundamentalists among us because you know there's a reason for it. There's there's a need for security and for certainty amid so much chaos. So you know, I'm not a big critic of fundamentalists. For that reason, and I, I try to be patient, and I probably have fundamentalist streak myself. So, and and it's very much the case in in the ranch community, which is a very tiny community already, that we have this uh, this problem. But you know, from my point of view, it's just common sense that if we are loved, if we are cared for, we're going to continue to receive revelation. My experience of this is that if, number one, New Age folks don't know uh, about its existence, 
at least in the United States for the most part. And mm -hmm. secondly, if, if they do know, they're really not that interested for a variety of reasons, uh, especially because it actually sounds to them a little bit like Orthodox Christianity. Uh, right. Because it actually it just states that Jesus, you know, actually was an incarnate deity and that, uh, you know, some of the precepts of Orthodox Christianity, it actually affirms and expands them. So that's really not something New Age folks are interested in. They're in rebellion against the Christian tradition for the most part. Or if, if they're sort of unity church, I don't know how well you know about the, the New Thought people, it's, it's too specific for them. You know, New Thought it, it tends to, to prefer, you know, philosophic uh, um, uh, ideas and not specifics about history and, and cosmology. And it's just not their, not their bailiwick. And I really think that the Arantia book has been actively suppressed in high places. I don't have sort of smoking gun evidence, but I have circumstantial evidence of it. And we're talking about just throughout the media, in publishing circles, in seminaries. It's, I think there's been a, 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 an active, conscious suppression. And I think that emanates from the, uh, the groups that the Rancher book is describing when it describes the prehistory uh, going back to its satanic roots. And in the Arantia book, in, in more than anywhere I've ever seen, is a clear and clean description of who these bloodlines are, how they originated, and uh, how they operated. And so the, it is, it, it's describing who they are and who their chief celestial was that they, that they worshipped, Lucifer, and presents that in such a way that it's unmistakable who, who this is, what this is. And I think those are the groups behind the scenes that were suppressing the Arantia book. Very interesting. You know what? Let's get into that right now. Let's, let's get into the, uh, the rebellion of Lucifer, what happened there and what the book says about this, because we're, we want to try to understand, of course, our prehistory to, to try to unravel some of the issues that we uh, are, are faced with today. What does the book say about Lucifer, what character he was, and, uh, and what happened, basically? Okay, so Lucifer... So I've given some of the cosmology for background so that folks can try to get a handle on this. Now, Lucifer is in the celestial hierarchy at the level of what they call the local system. So I've mentioned briefly that you have what's known as local universe, which is up to 10 million inhabited planets, and it has a celestial administration. And then the, the smallest administrative unit of a local universe is known as a local system, which is up to 1,000 inhabited planets. And its angelic administration is, is headed up by a being of the order that Lucifer was. And I won't get into the name of that. It's, it's a little arcane. But beings of that, celestial beings of that order are administrators who oversee the sort of the, the celestial hierarchy of these planets in this in a local system and there's an awful lot that goes into that and uh, part three of the ranch book uh, explains that in some detail but in any case these are high beings who are specially chosen and specially trained to manage uh, millions of celestial beings who are in turn managing planets inhabited planets they're not just managing they're ministering to their their loving their, their ministrations are loving and, but there's other things that they do, such as in the realms of biology, for example, that we can get into. But in any case, uh, Lucifer was at a level in the celestial hierarchy where there's a possibility that a celestial being can get the idea that there's something amiss, not amiss, but something, something that, is, that they can't quite see far above them, because there's this teaching that there's a central universe wherein God the Father resides and that in his stead, there's a, a local uh, being, local creator beings I mentioned before, who are the creators of the local universe. And we have this huge mission to take human beings and into a, an eternal life career so that they can ascend into the central universe. I haven't mentioned that, but that's what eternal life is supposed to be, according to the Rancher book. There's an ascension. Mm -hmm. So these, these local celestials don't really see this very much they're local and so in very rare one in a million cases they can get the idea that there's there's some kind of uh, control system above them and they can they can begin to question it and then eventually rebel 
And so Lucifer went off the rails because he began to question the the administrator, what's what I like to call the multiverse, the, the higher universe administration, uh, because he couldn't really discern what was really going on. He had to take it on faith, and he rejected that faith. So he, he was, began, sorry yeah, to interrupt, but he, he was unhappy with his uh, role, basically, what he was uh, meant to do then, in a way. Correct, exactly, because he felt that it was kind of a waste of time to manage, not so much a waste of time, but it was, it was not an efficient use of time to manage planets in the way they were doing it. And the way they were doing it was very, very incremental. And that is really one of the great messages of the Arantia book, which is that evolution is, uh, is the supreme uh, activity in the, in the in time-space universe, but it's very slow, very incremental. In fact, it's, it's, you can, you can uh, see that when you understand that it says the universe, physical universe is a trillion years old. It's a lot slower in, in its evolution than the 13.7 billion years old. So, you know, Lucifer's watching this very slow unfolding of, of, these, of these planets, which are his wards, and, and very slow evolution of life and very slow evolution of humans over, over uh, eons, and begins to think, this is just an administrative superstructure that's getting its kicks, telling us what to do down here. <laughs> we, we can do it better. And we will do it better. And he had certain prerogatives, which uh, permitted him to override what was being done from higher, from the higher realms. And so he then went around to his subject planets, trying to convince the angelic hierarchy of these planets to go with his new plan, the Lucifer plan. But of, of those planets, there are a little bit over 600 in our local system. Uh, only 37 went over to his side. The Rancha book is basically just is more uh, descriptive than what we've heard before. Is that correct? Much more, because if you look at Genesis, for example, which uh, speaks of the, just in a few lines, and I'm sure you know about this well, of the renowned men of old who went into the daughters of men and kind of created a hybrid race yep. and all of that, and the Nephilim and, and these giants that they speak of very briefly in the Bible. This story is the result of the Lucifer Rebellion on our planet Urantia, wherein now, now I have to kind of uh, go off on, a, uh, on sort of the, the, the planetary aspect of the rebellion, if you like. Oh, sure, sure. So here on our planet, we have, every planet has a planetary chief administrator. And the chief administrator of our planet was named Caligastia. And Caligastia was convinced by the Lucifer uh, Manifesto to go over to the dark side. So in so doing, the whole planet administration swung over with him. And what was happening at that time was, remember earlier, Henrik, we talked about the earlier revelations that were completely lost. Mm, yep. You know, there's a lot of legends and, and sort of, you know, if you, if you look at the, the story of the Anunnaki deciphered from the cuneiform tablets, Sumerian cuneiform tablets, there was some, there were these gods that descended at some point. And in these legends, which are in many other civilizations, that these gods came down. And then there's what you might call the combat myth, that there was, a, there was warfare between them. And uh, so the ranch book, uh, you know, goes on for a couple hundred pages telling you what that was. And what that was is that the, there was an administration of beings who had incarnated 500,000 years ago. And this group were beings who had been spe specifically designed to appear like human beings, but they were actually off-planet beings who took on bodies use, using actually the DNA from, from local tribes. And they constructed bodies and forms for these persons, these off-planet persons, who were kind of planetary missionaries. And there were 100 of them who incarnated 500,000 years ago a near uh, an area near the Persian Gulf, near the, the current country of Bahrain, and created a, a, a city there which was to be the planetary capital. And there is in archaeology a city named Dilmun, which is a was a later evolution of this of this city, and it was here that the rebellion caused a, a tremendous degeneration of what had been built up there. 
Very, very interesting. Now, let, let's backtrack a little bit here and just want to ask you again what actually Lucifer wanted to do. What Did he want to speed up the process of, of evolution and effectively kind of take over as the uh, head administrator of uh, Earth or, or Urantia? Or, or what did he want to do, really? Yeah, what he wanted to do, for, first of all, his manifesto said that there's no God, there's no deity. It was an atheist uh, teaching. So that's a huge, huge rebellion. And secondly, that this this superstructure that was controlling evolution through the him, through administrators like himself, was not skillful the way that the locals could be. It was sort of like the idea of local control of your politics, you might say. Mm-hmm. And so we were going to do, do it better. And the way we're going to do it is by not paying so much attention to the free will of human beings. That is to say, you know, the, the way the evolution occurs once uh, human beings appear on a planet is that they have to freely choose things and it might take them uh, eons to choose certain things unless they're specifically taught to do so and but this is the most effective way to evolve uh, civilizations it's been learned in millions and millions and millions of planets who've evolved over the eons but not not according to lucifer according to him it would be something more akin to what communism is <laughs> compared to sort of natural capitalism, wherein, you know, the capitalist ethic, and, you know, I'm not a big fan of capitalism, but is, is the notion of you freely use resources to create private property and, and business without over-control of some central administration. But communism would say, no, we can speed that up. We can centralize administration and do things more effectively and more efficiently, but that may mean you are not going to let you have your own garden plot and grow your own vegetables. You're not going to have the freedom to raise money and start a business. <laughs> We're not going to let you do that because that that causes uh, chaos, not so much chaos, but it, it's an inefficient way to do production. <laughs> so we're, we're going to centralize production and we're going to call the shots from above and it's better for you. And it's funny uh, because when they do that, everything goes to hell as well and it, <laughs> nobody, nothing works after that point. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you, you live in Europe. I, I traveled in... in in Russia, and I, I saw some of the results of this. Oh, and, it's horrible! And so, Absolutely it's, horrible! Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, yeah. Moscow, and I, I, I've seen, I've seen, you know, some of this. Not, not as much as maybe you have, but yeah, it's, I, it's, it's rampant in, in, in Sweden, and it's there's a f- full on, you know, corporatism uh, infused with the uh, socialism there. So I see the I- tremendous um, detrimental effects that that this type of thinking has, and it's interesting as well because if we tie in this, then what we hear, or what I've heard anyway, from the story of Lucifer and a little bit like that, is that it's it's a reverse of what you basically said. It was the idea is that it's God's law or, or God's decision that actually is uh, steeped in order, and basically there is no free will in in His universe or her universe, whatever. And and it's Lucifer who comes along and kind of breaks that pattern, being the rebellion to actually offer human beings free will. But what you're saying, what you're sharing from the Urantia book, is the reverse of that. Yeah, it's it's complicated, but yeah, it's actually uh, it's like propaganda or, or Orwellian propaganda saying we're we're actually making you free, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we're, you know, it's we're it's really not uh, freedom. It's 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 the communist part. You know, it's uh, Leon Trotsky is going to tell you how to how to run your economy, and you you locals really can't figure it out. Yeah. So <laughs> it's really like that. And certainly, I was a Marxist when I was in my early twenties, and I. I really understand the appeal of this, and and it, so it's an idea that has a lot of currency on our planet. Which Unfortunately, is, it does. It does. Yeah, yeah. yeah so certain elites, we, the elites know better, and and let them, you know, take control of your rights, and you don't really know, you know, and, and so so it is a, a set of paradoxes. In the name of freedom, they remove your freedom. That's right. Hmm. Very very interesting. Yeah, we're going to take a break here, and but we want to talk a little bit more about basically where people can go to well to find the texts and find the updated versions of all of this as far as i've figured out so far of course the the rancher book is available on on many different websites and and uh so why don't we cover this a little bit are there different versions out there now where, where is there original one and 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 you know translations updated ones what's what's your take on this because it is kind of a mess isn't it out there right now um no i don't think it's all that bad uh, there's really just two big publishers there's the the Ranch Foundation, the original copyright holder, and they do a great job of publishing the book 
they have done an, uh, an, a superb job of getting translations done. And I mentioned previously, there is a Swedish translation, even though Sweden is a totally secular country, probably not a huge market, but, <clears throat> uh, and, um, but uh, most of the European languages are done, even things like Lithuanian, you know, Russian, Greek is nearly done, um, but all the your main European languages are done. But no, you, you can easily get it in books, at least in the States, you can get it in bookstores, but it's easily available in European translations in, in uh, European bookstores, as far as I know. And there's a Chinese translation that's some years away. Japanese is not too far from, Arabic is actually in process, Hindi. So it's, it's widely available. It's not really an issue of getting the ranch book. Also, you can download uh, ebook versions. And a lot of people are putting out free ebook versions of it now. And there's hundreds of thousands of people downloaded the ebook of the ranch book in recent years. Excellent. L let's talk about your website a little bit as well on some of the updated versions that, that you have out there and, and anything else. I mean, as you said, you're a publisher, you have a lot of different titles out there. Uh, you know, please go ahead and, and, and mention a few of these so people know where to go to find out more about you and, and your work as well. Thanks, Henrik. Uh, my uh, main site is evolving-souls.org. There's a hyphen in there, evolving, evolving souls with a hyphen, .org. And there I have the five books that uh, we have published uh, that are secondary works about the Rancher book. Uh, my specialty is in publishing the supplemental materials, which are these new transmissions from the same teachers. It's controversial stuff, but uh, I, I think people will find it a very good way to access the spirit of the Arantia book, including my brand new book, uh, which is called The Adventure of Being Human which is featured there, and that those are advanced teachings, spiritual teachings, based on the Urantia revelation. There's a lot to talk about, a lot of material here, of course, and we'll uh, we'll get to it as much as we can. We're going to continue, of course, and, and primarily talk about the Urantia book, but uh, if we have time later, we might talk a little bit about some of these updates and, of course, some of your other books as well. But uh, let's take a short break here at this point. Uh, the websites are going to be linked up on Red Ice Creations, uh, dot com, evolving-souls.org, and Origin Press. Uh, dot org for you as well so you can click through easily from there but uh, we'll take a short break at this point 